everyone, and welcome to the second week of our Lenten study as we survey the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament. And today we're going to discuss Exodus, and uh, we'll begin with its chronology, and you can follow along with that chronology, if you like, in the PDF notes that are available on the launch page. Uh, so, Exodus. Uh, at the end of Genesis, uh, the Israelites, thanks in large part to Joseph, they're thriving. At least they're thriving, at least with regards to their numbers. And, and this is happening in Egypt. Um, and while at the beginning of Exodus, Abraham's descendants are slaves to Pharaoh, that population growth worries Pharaoh who decides to eliminate, to call the herd, I guess, for lack of a better description, to call the Hebrews, to uh, bring down their numbers. And he orders, um, he makes a proclamation that all newborn Israelite males uh, are to be killed, are to be murdered. And the midwives for the Israelites, um, they refuse to obey this order. So Pharaoh has his own people throw uh, the firstborn into the Nile River. Um, and at that point, we meet Moses, who is an Israelite baby. And Moses is placed by his mother into uh, the Nile, but in a reed a, re a basket made of reeds. And I, I would suggest that maybe we don't miss the literary irony here, which is the act of, you know, Moses' mother complying with authority, putting Moses into the river, while also subverting that authority. Moses is tossed into the river, but he is in a basket made of reeds, so he is safe. So there's a, a, I, I, there's a little bit of literary resistance going on here. And the basket is found by Pharaoh's daughter, who names the baby Moses. Now, the sister of Moses, who was watching the basket, she tells Pharaoh's daughter that she could find an Israelite woman to nurse the child until, uh, until weaning age. And that Israelite woman turns out to be the actual, the biological mother of Moses. And there's an interesting little side note here um, with regards to a relatively unknown uh, literary figure named Sargon the Great. Now, last week I talked about how the narrative of the flood was based on the previously existing Mesopotamian flood myth. Well, the story of Sargon the Great, which predates the Moses narrative by about a thousand years, it tells the story of an illegitimate son of a Mesopotamian high priestess who, because of the scandal his illegitimate birth would have created, placed the baby whose name was Sargon, in a reed basket and set him afloat on the, the Euphrates. A gardener then finds the baby, raises the baby, and Sargon eventually grows up to take his place as king. And in essence, this is actually, if you sort of deconstruct it, is the inverse of the Moses narrative, sort of the reverse of the Moses narrative. And so it doesn't take much of a leap to see that the Moses narrative probably had its origins or its inspiration, perhaps, from the narrative of Sargon the Great. And again, this was not unusual in uh, ancient texts for one myth to sort of piggyback another myth. And, uh, and because of the Israelites' uh, exposure to Mesopotamian myths because of their exile, this makes all the sense in the world. Now, 
Back to Exodus. After Moses is weaned, he is returned to Pharaoh and then is raised as royalty. And then we fast forward to Moses as an adult. And this is where Moses murders an, an Egyptian uh, supervisor, a taskmaster, for beating uh, an Israelite uh, slave. So Moses, after this, flees Egypt, gets out of town, and goes to Midian. And in Mid Midian, Moses meets his wife, Zephorah, and lives in her father's camp until he is 80 years old. And then Moses, tending to the flocks on Mount Sinai, Moses witnesses a burning bush. But this burning bush is not consumed by the fire, by the flames. Moses also hears the voice of God. And God informs Moses that Moses has been chosen to lead the Israelites out of their enslavement. And Moses doesn't really want this responsibility. And he gives several excuses why he is the wrong person for the job. But God assures Moses that God will give him the words to say and that his brother, Moses' brother, Aaron, will help him along the way. So Moses and Aaron return to Egypt uh, and they convince the Israelite people that God will free them when they confront Pharaoh and declare with the words, let my people go. And this is what they do. They confront Pharaoh and say, let my people go. And Pharaoh, not surprisingly, refuses. I mean, he has a lot to lose, right? If, if he loses his slave labor, the economy would probably crash. And this is something the United States knows all too well with our history of slavery and basically this country being built on the backs of slaves and a, a, a development that would have been impossible had um, white people in the United States have if they've had if they had to have paid for it, it would have probably been impossible to accomplish. So Pharaoh's in the same boat here. So he doesn't want to give up his slave labor because they're getting lots of stuff done. So Pharaoh, as sort of like a punishment for this audacity of of Moses and Aaron, uh, Pharaoh adds to the work burden that the Israelites are under. Uh, you know, it's kind of like I said, it's kind of like a, a punishment for what Moses did. And then the Israelite people, because of the added work, they now turn on Moses because of the trouble he has caused them. But then Moses is assured by God that everything is a okay and stick to the plan, full steam ahead. So Moses returns to Pharaoh and Pharaoh still refuses to free those Hebrews who are enslaved. So then God unleashes the famous or infamous 10 plagues upon Egypt. And these 10 plagues are in order. The Nile River is turned to blood. Frogs emerge from the Nile and cover the land. Gnats swarm the area. Flies swarm the area. Uh, Egypt's livestock drops dead. Boils then cover the Egyptians as well as their animals or the animals that are left. A hailstorm destroys Egypt's crops and, again, any remaining livestock. Then locusts consume uh, whatever's left. And then darkness covers the land for three days. And then finally, after all of this, and Pharaoh still not giving it up, Egypt's firstborn are killed by God. Now, interestingly, 
Exodus chapter 12, verse 12 says that the judgments of God or by God are actually against other gods. They're, these are judgments not even necessarily against the people, but they're against the gods that of Egypt that these people worshipped. For example, the, the plague of turning the Nile to blood is actually a critique of, <laughs> ironically named, Happy, uh, the Nile River God. And the darkening of the sun was a critique of the sun god Ra. Now this would make sense, as the Jewish writers who were writing this narrative, who were putting this story together, they were trying to establish Yahweh, the God of the Jews. They were trying to establish Yahweh as the one God above all other gods. Because remember, in the Hebrew Bible, it doesn't say there's only one God. The Hebrew Bible acknowledges a, a great number of gods, but that Yahweh is the God above all gods. So Pharaoh, now mourning the death of his own son, Pharaoh summons Moses and Aaron, declaring now finally that the Israelites can leave Egypt. And Pharaoh actually even goes to the extent of giving them wealth for the trip. And if you remember... Last week, we talked about echoes and themes within the Hebrew Bible. Pharaoh giving the, the Jews wealth as they left is kind of somewhat of a direct retelling of Abraham and Sarah's experience with Pharaoh in Genesis. The Hebrew Bible, again, often repeats or echoes themes in its various stories as a way of sort of doubling down on the ideas and the ethics and the premise, premises, premises, premises of, of the, the morals and the ethics that they're trying to get across. So this is definitely an echo of Abraham and Sarah uh, finally breaking free of Pharaoh, leaving Egypt and that Pharaoh giving them wealth to do so. So God leads the Israelites into the wilderness. And it's not just a few people. I mean, the numbers are over a million people. And so this is no small task. And in order to keep everyone sort of on track and together and, and heading in the right direction so they don't lose anyone, God appears as a pillar of cloud by day. And at night, God appears as a pillar of fire. Now, Pharaoh, probably realizing the economic effects of letting a million slaves leave, Pharaoh decides that he's made a mistake and sets out with his army to recapture them. And so Pharaoh pursues them to the Red Sea, where Moses famously raises his staff and the waters part, and this allows the Israelites to cross on dry ground. And while they cross, God stalls Pharaoh's army with a wall of fire. And when the army is finally able to sort of pursue again to evade this wall of fire, Moses lowers his arms and the Red Sea closes up and drowns the Egyptian army. So then Moses leads the Israelites to Mount Sinai. And frightened, I mean, these people are going through some trauma, right? So, I mean, not only the, I mean, they experienced the 10 plagues as well. It may not have hit them personally, but they experienced it. And then they're being pursued by an army. They see this all inspiring act of the Red Sea parting and walls of fire and an entire army drowning. And now they're sort of stuck out in the wilderness. So, the Israelites have, have been faced some trauma, and then they hear God's voice. And the Israelites ask Moses, because they're so frightened, to speak to God on their behalf. 
So Moses with Joshua climbs Mount Sinai where God presents him with the famous Ten Commandments, the laws that will supposedly govern God's people. And these commandments are, number one, you shall have no other gods before me. Number two, you shall not make idols. Now, these first two, probably, I don't think the uh, people who were involved with the CPAC convention this year got that memo <laughs> with, with the golden Trump. But nonetheless, um, those are the first two. You shall have no other gods before me, and you shall not make idols. And number three, you shall not lift up God's name in vain. Number four, keep the Sabbath. Number five, honor your father and mother. Number six, you shall not murder. Number seven, you shall not commit adultery. Number eight, you shall not steal. Number nine, you shall not bear false witness. And number 10, you shall not covet. Now, Moses is on Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights. And meanwhile, the Israelites grow impatient during this time. I mean, it's over a month, right? I mean, maybe Moses died, right? They don't know. So they grow impatient and they ask Aaron to build them a God that will continue to lead them. Now, where have we heard 40 days and 40 nights previous to this story? The flood, right? So again, we're seeing echoes and we're seeing themes repeating in the Hebrew Bible and of course we'll see this duration echo again in the Gospels when Jesus spends 40 days and nights in the desert. So Aaron builds a golden bull. God is upset by this idol. Um, it And, you know, similar to the Trump idol, it breaks two of the commandments right off the bat. No gods before me and idols. And God tells Moses that, that God is going to destroy the Israelites as a result of this infraction. But Moses begs God to reconsider. And he tells him that that by destroying the Israelites, the Egyptians would assume that God couldn't deliver God's people into the promised land. So basically it's like, if you kill us, then the Egyptians will think they were right, is what you know Moses says. And this has always come across to me. It, it's very interesting because it seems that Moses is making an appeal to God's competitive ego. Now, I know that's a matter of opinion, but what happens next? God changes their mind as a result of, you know, Moses' intercession. And God spares the Israelites, which, of course, begs the question of if God is all-knowing or omniscient as modern religion or maybe modern Christianity asserts, then why would God need to change their mind? Just some food for thought. So, Moses descends from the mountain at the end of 40 days, and enraged, he breaks the tablets containing the Ten Commandments. I mean, he just got them, right? And then he ends up breaking them. And then Moses destroys the golden bull idol um, by burning it, and then grinding it into dust, and then mixing it with water, and he makes the Israelites drink it. God then tells Moses that he will replace the broken, the broken tablets bearing the Ten Commandments. However, the New Commandments are not like an exact reproduction. They're considerably different from the originals. So technically, we have like 20 commandments, right? So the New Ten Commandments are, and some of them are similar, but the New Ten Commandments are, do not worship any other god for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Interesting. Do not make any idols. Celebrate the festival of unleavened bread. 
those are the first three. I'm, I, I'm sorry, I didn't number them. So one is do not worship any other god. Uh, the, the Lord's name is jealous. Number two is do not make any idols. Number three is celebrate the festival of unleavened bread. Number four, the first offspring of every womb belongs to me, God, including all the firstborn males of your livestock, whether from herd or flock. Number five, six days you shall labor, but on the seventh day you shall rest. Even during the plowing season and harvest, you must rest. Six, celebrate the festival of weeks with the first fruits of the wheat harvest and the festival of ingathering at the turn of the year. Seven, three times a year, all your men are to appear before the sovereign Lord, the God of Israel. Number eight, do not offer the blood of a sacrifice to me along with anything containing yeast and do not let any of the sacrifice from the Passover festival remain until morning. And then nine, bring the best of the first fruits of your soil to the house of the Lord your God. And number 10, and my favorite, do not cook a young goat in its mother's milk. So, um... So there's a few that are similar to the first 10 commandments. Most of them are different. So basically we have the 20 commandments uh, that, that comes from Exodus. Exodus also spends a considerable amount of time discussing God's tabernacle, which is viewed as God's residing place on earth. Earth. There is not this sense of imminence within the culture at this point. By imminence, I mean that God is is the, the presence of God is within creation, it has taken up itself in creation. Rather, God resides within God's tabernacle. And in the tabernacle, that is where the animal sacrifices are made by Israelites who are seeking forgiveness for sin. So you've sinned, you bring um, maybe a bird, maybe you bring a calf, um, wh whatever you have at your disposal, disposal uh, and you present it to the temple priest, you confess your sins uh, on the altar, they slit the animal's throat and the blood trickles down over the altar and your sins are forgiven. And so you can see sort of the uh, the, the metaphor, the symbology that then travels forth into the New Testament where Jesus becomes in one of the gospels, the Passover lamb who is sacrificed for our sins. Depend, I mean, if, if you take that theological approach. Um, but the tabernacle itself is divided into um, the, the, the front room, which is called the holy place, and the back room called the most holy place or the holy of holies. Now, only priests were permitted into the most holy place, which was considered uh, God's throne room, basically, and which contained, this room contained uh, the Ark of the Covenant, yes, from Raiders of the Lost Ark, um, and this Ark, this box, basically, uh, was where the, um, the second batch of the Ten Commandments were kept. So, as far as so that's that's basically sort of a a, a rundown of um, the book of Ex Exodus. Now, looking at sort of the 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 makeup of uh, the book of Exodus, uh, the book is divided into uh, three sections, and the first section is called the Exodus narrative, and that's sort of the story of the Exodus itself. And this narrative, at its core articulates how the God of the Israelites not only had power, but this God was willing to use that power to intercede, to override the dominant empire of Pharaoh through miracles that brings that empire to its knees. And really not only brings it to its knees, but with the elimination of the army, uh, the implication is that um, it, it's, it's, a, it's an empire that is no more, 
that is shattered. Now, historically, we know that we know that's not the case. But within the narrative, that is very much the case. God basically shatters Pharaoh and the kingdom in Egypt. The second part is the sojourn narrative, uh, which is the period from the end of the Exodus narrative to the arrival of the Israelites at Sinai. And then the third part of Exodus is called the Sinai tradition, the period where the Israelites make a, a covenant with God and they receive the commandments of how they should uh, live their lives. And as we briefly discussed last week, it is important to note that there is no extra biblical, historical, or archaeological evidence to corroborate anything f within the Exodus narratives. And what I mean by that is when I say extra biblical, um, anything outside of the Bible that might confirm this narrative. There really exists nothing. Um, the figure of Moses probably didn't exist. The act of the Exodus, there's really no archaeological evidence to confirm anything within the book. Now, biblical historian and archaeologist William Dever, who is probably one of the most uh, uh, prominent and knowledgeable uh, biblical historians and archaeologists ever, um, he wrote this. He wrote, quote, the whole Exodus conquest cycle of stories must now be set aside as largely mythical, but in the proper sense of the term myth. Perhaps historical fiction, but tales told primarily to validate religious beliefs, unquote. And if you remember, as we discussed last week, the Hebrew Bible is not necessarily interested, and the writers of the Hebrew Bible were not necessarily interested in sharing the historical details of God's people. And so sharing historical facts. Rather, the writers were looking to tell the story of God's people. If you talk to writers of the Hebrew Bible, if you were to travel back in time and travel across the ocean and be able to sit down and talk to people who were at that time writing the Bible and you talked about facts, historical facts, they wouldn't understand what you were saying or what you were talking about. Because facts were far less important than telling the story of where their people came from and how God brought them there. For many scholars, as well as for many believers, for many people of faith, the narrative intent of the text is more important than the historical veracity of the text. And why is that important? That is important because if your spirituality hinges on whether the Bible is factual or not, whether the Bible is accurate from a historical perspective, from a scientific perspective, from a cosmology perspective, then you have to then tie yourself into knots and engage in intellectual gymnastics in order to keep your faith alive, if it's based on the Bible being factually true. And unfortunately, a lot of people do that. A lot of people have a difficult time understanding that the Bible doesn't need to be factual in order to be true. Truth and fact are two different things. So rather than viewing Exodus as a type of factual reportage, 
we would find probably more benefit viewing it as a paradigm of efforts against tyranny and the expected deliverance from that tyranny. This paradigm would be and has proven to be prescient and important and inspirational throughout history. The Exodus narrative, let me give you an example here of, of what I mean by this, of being prescient throughout history. The Exodus narrative was seen by uh, th those enslaved out of Africa in America. The Exodus narrative was seen as a story that could be transposed over their situation, over their plight, over their enslavement. And as a result, you know, where, where, the, where the slave owners were Pharaoh and where the Africans were the Hebrews. And this transposing of this story over their situation provided inspiration and strength. And we know this because we, we, can, we can look at the testimony, the history, the, uh, the, the writings of folks who were enslaved and their, and their relatives. And we can see how important the Exodus narrative was for them. So this transposing, this, this mythological um, uh, um, 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 tent that the Exodus story created, this was the expectation for the Jewish writers, that these narratives would become liturgical, not only for memory, not only for remembrance of where God's people came from, but that the narratives could be reenacted liturgically in later times, in future times, in other places that were in need of emancipation, that were in need of, of freedom and resistance. For example, the sojourn narrative, the period where the Israelites wander in the desert for 40 years, this represents a symbolic existential crisis. We talked about Noah in, in sort of the belly of the ship during the storm after sort of the genocide of the world and Noah and his family are the only ones left and the storm is raging around him and he's experiencing symbolically an existential crisis within the belly of the ship. Well, it's very similar here. The Sinai narrative reveals an existential crisis of the Israelites, of the Jewish people, one where this small fledgling nation was seeking an identity. And whether viewed metaphorically or psychologically, this is something that I think all of us can relate to at different points in our lives, right? I mean, for example, the journey from high school to college can, for many people, it can become a desert where we struggle to find our way or we seek to leave one identity back home while we seek out another at school. Or someone transitioning where one identity is being left behind and through great trial and difficulties entering into a new identity or for older folks, the process of retiring, moving from an identity of, uh, of, of perhaps an identity tied up into a role or a position or a job and retiring and moving into a new identity or even losing a partner it can feel like a period of lost identity, of wandering in the desert until one finds transformation and a new way of living and a new way to identify themselves. Another way to view it might be that the Israelites are moving from a life of oppression to one of freedom. A stark change that any long-term ex-offender transitioning from jail to civilian life can bear witness to. 
one that can often bring many crises and emotional dangers. I worked uh, with the homeless community in Columbus, Ohio, and one of the, the, the major components of the homeless community are ex-offenders who, because of their record, can't find decent housing, can't get a job because they have to check that offender's box. And so there's this desert dwelling period that they have to go through, an existential crisis that they have to work their way through, very similar to the Israelites. And the message in Exodus, not only for the Israelites, but for all of us who can transpose this story onto an aspect of our lives, the message is clear. Trust in the divine through the desert and your faith will be rewarded. To emphasize this, the book of Exodus provides like the three steps of faith for God's people. And that those three steps are DCP. The first is deliverance. God delivers from oppression. And we, it's, I mean, that is sort of like the overriding theme of the book of Exodus, right? God delivers from oppression. That's the big story. The lead is not buried. That's what is led off with. Um, and that is done primarily through the 10 plagues. The second is covenant. As a result of God's deliverance, the response of God's people should be obedience to the divine. And finally, presence. As a result of the first two, as a result of deliverance and then covenant, uh, there is God's presence. God will reside with us as modeled in the tabernacle and God's residing within the holy of holies. So, we are delivered, we make a covenant with the divine, and then as a result of that covenant, the divine dwells with us and within us. Okay, um, that's probably enough time for today. I don't want to pull what I did last week and ramble on for an hour. So we're going to stop there. I think that's a good stopping point. Um, next week, we'll talk about a few more books, but then we're going to also, um, I'm going to get into, I, I, last week I mentioned Joseph Campbell a little bit. Um, and I, I want to sort of talk a little Joseph Campbell next week and how Campbell's study of mythology and religion um, is sort of a really good uh, conversation to have going around, in particular, the Hebrew Bible. So uh, we'll, we'll talk a few more books. We'll talk some Joseph Campbell next week. Uh, but that's enough for this week. And as always, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to uh, send them my way. But beyond that, I think we're done. So have a, uh, have a wonderful week and have a great second week of Lent. Thank you.